I'm Mark Kelly, Mr. Saltwater Tank, coming to you on behalf of saltwateraquarium.com. As your tank starts to mature and your corals start to grow, you're going to need to replace the alkalinity, calcium, magnesium that's been uptaked by those corals. Now, there's a couple of different ways to do that, and I'm going to talk about it in this episode. The first method is with a water change, and it's the easiest method there is. Do a water change, replace those elements. Here's the thing about using a water change to replace alkalinity, calcium, and magnesium. It works, but only so well. So you can only do so big of a water change. You only want to do so big of a water change. Even if I had a 55 gallon tank and I can do a 55 gallon water change, I wouldn't want to do it because I could send my tank parameters to a wild roller coaster ride. Not what you want for your tank. Here's the other thing about using water changes to boost alkalinity, calcium, magnesium levels. It's not going to do all that much for you because look, let's say your alkalinity is seven and you want to get it up to eight and a half. For you to do a large enough water change to boost that alkalinity to that amount, you're going to have to do a large water change and the value of the alkalinity in the upcoming incoming water is going to have to be really big. Remember back in school when you get like a couple A's and then you get a zero and then it knocked down your GPA a lot? It's the same thing in reverse. If you're a B student and all of a sudden you want to become an A plus student, you're not going to do that with just one A. You're going to need A pluses and you're going to need a lot of them. So water changes work. They work really well when your tank is young. You're starting to get your corals growing and you don't have to do much of a change with alkalinity, calcium, and magnesium. Now, when you move beyond water changes, you're gonna to need to either use a dosing pump or you're gonna to need to use a calcium reactor. What are those two things? How do they work and how do you decide? Let's dive into that. Dosing pumps. Some are standalone, meaning that you don't need a controller to run them. The Ecotech Marine Versa and the Kmore dosers are some examples. Some dosing pumps are controller driven, like the Neptune Dose and the GHL Slave Unit. Both of these units need a separate brain or controller for the dosing pump to work. One nice thing about dosing pumps is that they're usually compact, so they work well if you have to mount them in a stand. Any dosing pump requires a liquid solution that you're going to dose, so you're going to need a reservoir to hold that dosing solution. One gallon jugs are commonly used, as a lot of dosing chemicals come in jugs that size. Here's a couple of benefits of dosing pumps. First, they're compact. It's easy to put them underneath your tank inside of your stand because they don't take up a lot of space. So if you have to fit all your gear inside of your stand, dosing pumps make a lot of sense. And with dosing pumps, you can individually raise compounds or elements that you're dosing. For example, say you want to raise your calcium levels without also raising your alkalinity levels. Not a problem with a dosing pump. Simply dose more calcium solution while not changing your alkalinity solution. Now some advantages with dosing pumps is that as your tank starts to get big in the two to 300 gallon range, and as your corals really start to take off and grow, the cost benefit really goes down. It takes a lot of alkalinity and calcium and magnesium to pump into those tanks to get those tanks to maintain their levels, again, especially once your corals are really growing and uptaking those elements. So you're constantly making up more solution, dosing it into your tank. Some of you may be saying, well, wait, it just makes up a lot of solution. Okay, look, maybe you can mix up a five gallon jug, but if you have to fit everything under your tank, where are you gonna put the five gallon jug? Or in my case, if I had to dose a lot of alkalinity in this tank here, it might take a 35 gallon brute trash can. So over time, in the two to 300 gallon tank size, once those corals start growing, dosing pumps make less and less sense. In that case, you're gonna to wanna to go to a calcium reactor. Let's talk calcium reactors. Here's the one on my thousand gallon reef. Now, if you look into this and saying, wow, that looks pretty big, it is, keep in mind, my reef is a thousand gallons. I'm planning for needing a lot of calcium and alkalinity out of this thing down the line, especially once my corals get going. So if you're thinking about a calcium reactor and you're looking at this and going, I don't have space for that, keep in mind, this one's a little bit oversized because I have a big reef and I know I'm gonna have lots of growth. So any calcium reactor has these components. There is the main calcium reactor chamber here Inside it, this brown stuff is calcium reactor media. I use the two little fishies reborn media in my calcium reactor. There's also a recirculation pump. And this set up here on the geo, I upgraded to the Cisha pump because it's very reliable and they're workhorses. Its job is to circulate water inside of the calcium reactor as well as take the incoming carbon dioxide, that's CO2, and smash it up and help it dissolve to lower the pH in the calcium reactor chamber. There's also a pH probe up here, 
which is connected to, in my case, a Neptune Systems Apex. With any calcium reactor, you have to have some kind of pH controller, whether it be a Neptune Systems Apex, GHL controller, or standalone pH controller. Its job is to monitor the pH of the calcium reactor chamber. If it gets too high, it opens up something called a CO2 regulator to let CO2 out of a CO2 bottle holding the carbon dioxide to then inject it into the calcium reactor to lower the pH in here so that the media melts. When that media melts, alkalinity and, and calcium are released into something called effluent. That's the water coming out of the calcium reactor. Then it goes into your tank for your corals to use. Now in my calcium reactor, I added a second chamber here, which is also filled with calcium reactor media. Its job is to raise the pH of the effluent coming out of the calcium reactor. Now keep this in mind. As your tank starts to grow, you have to lower the pH in the calcium reactor so that you're melting more media so that you have more alkalinity and calcium added to your tank. That means you're going to be adding more low pH effluent to your tank. If you get to the point where you're adding a lot of effluent to your tank and it needs to be a very low pH so that you're getting lots of media melt, it can affect your overall tank's pH. I've never run into that, but I put that disclaimer on there because some people out there are pH junkies. I want to let them know about that. So the second chamber is just there as a backup. It helps raise the pH of the effluent in case they ever get to that point. Now you do need a feed pump to dry the calcium reactor. You've got to pump water into it so that it can do its job. But overall, that's all that's needed out of a calcium reactor. Now some of you may be looking at this going, oh heck, that seems like a lot. And I can relate. When I first saw a calcium reactor, I was like, oh heck, what is this? Some kind of like rocket ship or something? I got tubes coming out of stuff and a bottle and blah, blah, blah. Once you run this thing for about a month, it becomes second nature. It's very straightforward. Calcium reactors really start to win on large systems. You simply can't dose enough economically and without using a lot of time on a large system to keep off demand, especially when that tank gets grown in. On my thousand gallon reef, once everything really kicks in and my corals get large and therefore start sucking up more calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium, if I needed to dose this tank, it could take a couple gallons a day just to keep up with demand. That means I'm gonna need a brute trash can full of calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium solutions without having to come in here every day and mix up solutions to refill my dosing container. With a calcium reactor, when the media gets low, you pour some more in, put the top back on, and you're good to go. Every couple months, you're gonna to need to refill that CO2 bottle, but that's easy. Turn off the valve, take off the regulator, put a new bottle in, put on the regulator, turn back on the valve, and you're ready to go. It's a really set it and forget it type of solution, and when you do need to do some work on a calcium reactor, it takes minimal time. Whether you're using a dosing pump or a calcium reactor, know that they both can work for your tank. As I talked about earlier in the episode, if you're using a larger tank, those dosing pumps, well, the cost benefit really starts to go down when you get over that two to 300 gallon range. But if someone's giving you a hard time because you're running a calcium reactor instead of dosing pumps or vice versa, who cares? You don't have time for that. Both of those methods work. They have their pros and cons. And in the end, once you pick a method, look, try it out for at least a month. Make sure this thing is gonna work for you. There's some learning curve to both dosing pumps and calcium reactors. You're gonna hit some bumps in the road. That's part of it. Learn, react, and then keep going. I'm Mark Cowan, Mr. Saltwater Tank, coming to you on behalf of saltwateraquarium.com. I'll catch you in the next episode. Mm -hmm.